So I'm going to uh, weave a tale of how you can use developmental biology and developmental insights into uh, the study of platypotent stem cells with the very targeted goal of making a, a, a therapeutically uh, applicable cell type. Uh, so I'm sure many of you are aware that there's a, there's a, new, a revolution in stem cell biology with the introduction of both pluripotent and uh, IPS cells. I'm going to refer to them both as pluripotent stem cells. And it's really their ability to give rise to differentiated cell types in a Petri dish and then capture these cell types for applications ranging from developmental biology, drug discovery, cell replacement therapy, and studying disease mechanisms. Uh, clearly, to uh, uh, achieve this, we need to make the right cells and probably have them at the right maturation step, and that's really going to be the focus of my talk. I'll focus on the cardiac lineage and with a very direct application of that cell replacement therapy. And so the overall goal then is to <coughs> imagine a scenario where we can, at some point in the future, replace the uh, the the scar tissue in a heart that's from a patient that suffered a myocardial infarction with new cardiomyocytes generated from pluripotent stem cells and then essentially making new ventricular myocardium. And this distinguishes this approach from most other cell therapies where uh, the, the effort there has been more in paracrine mechanisms putting other cell types into the heart that actually do not contract. And we gain a lot of hope that this is going to work, and this is a paper from Michael Aflem and Chuck Murray several years ago where they took human pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes, transplanted them into a primate in which they had induced an infarct, and showed very nicely uh, that you, you could uh, get human, new, human myocardium shown uh, shown by the green uh, cells here make, uh, in grafting in the animals. Uh, importantly, these cells replace a significant portion of the scar. They, trans they, they electrically integrated with the host myocardium, but there was transient arrhythmias possibly due to transplantation of mixed cardiomyocyte populations. Are you keeping timing going here? The timer's not moving. Yeah, Just I'm saying. Yeah, don't worry. Okay. I'm, I'm watching. Uh, there's multiple. You've stopped time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so how do we do this? So the overall goal, the overall focus of my next 10 minutes is to let you know how we're addressing the issue of making the right cell for transplantation. So we all know there are multiple cell types in the heart. And these are distinct populations that we argue represent distinct lineages that are patterned very early in development. And that's really what I want to show you today. So we have the ventricular, atrial, and pacemaker cell types of the heart. And when you start differentiating a pluripotent stem cell, you have the chance of making all of these cell types in a heart. And if you put drastically mixed populations, then you're going to probably run into problems. So the real challenge here is to make pure populations of a specific cell type. In the case of replacing ventricular myocardium, we want to make ventricular cardiomyocytes. And so the approach we use is to translate lessons from developmental biology. How does this happen in different systems? And we'll hear later how it works in the FISH model. And we look at, at the mouse, the chick, and we gain an understanding of how the heart develops. And largely, it's, it develops from mesodermal cells that migrate in the, in the rodent to the anterior region of the heart, where it forms a crescent, which then forms a tube. And shortly after tube formation, we get specification into the different uh, chambers. And that's really the challenge we're going to face. We then get heart looping, the four-chambered heart. We don't dream we're ever going to make a four-chambered heart in the dish. But we're going to look at how, how this works in the Petri dish. And essentially, I'm drawing this as a lineage map. It's a developmental lineage progression. I'm going to talk to you about the distinction between atrial and ventricular cells. And you'll understand why as I go along. These lineages are specified very early. If you get the specification, specification correct, you get uh, highly enriched populations. So this has worked from our lab for many, many years. And what it's showing is really a progression as trying to mimic what happens in the embryo where we go through the different stages. And really, we're looking at two important ones. That's inducing mesoderm 
and we can monitor it by the expression of PDGF receptor alpha and KDR and specifying it through wind inhibition. And really what we're looking at here, and I put these two numbers up, is X amount of BMP and X amount of activin because it's this, these two, rea these two signaling molecules that determine what we're going to make in the Petri dish. And then we have other markers to follow as we go along. And here you can see an outcome of an appropriately patterned population. These are contracting sheets of myocardia. Many people make these now. We have, uh, as monitored on the right by cardiac troponin and T, and we can ask what cells are generated. And most of us who followed the development of just contracting cells found out we we're making largely ventricular-like cells as shown by expression of MLC2B here. Or if you convert this to flow cytometry and com combined with troponin and T, oh, there's one of these. I should have. Uh, you can see that most of the troponin and T positive cells are MLC2V. And then the final analysis, you can do patch clamping and show that roughly 90 plus percent have a ventricular type electrophysiological profile, whereas some five or five plus percent may be pacemaker like. So most of the cells are ventricular, but they are mixed with these protocols. So let me just ex uh, introduce you to how we make atrial cardiomyocytes. And this comes from work from largely from Nadia Rosenthal, but a few other groups that showed very early on that retinoic acid is a key player. And if you deplete the developing embryo of retinoic acid, you don't have atria. If you give too much retinoic acid, you have enlarged atria. And there was a defined time window where this would work. And so we, we then took a couple of markers, such as a transcription factor IRX4, the MLC2V as ventricular markers, ANF and KCNJ3 as atrial markers, and, and electrophysiological profiles, and asked what happens if we dump retinoic acid into our cultures at four different time points. And then analyzed uh, at day 20, you get largely the same number of uh, cardiomyocytes, but you, what you will see is if you add retinoic acid between day and th three and five, you lose dramatically your ventricular profile, and you gain atrial markers. And you can show this very nicely by flow cytometry, where uh, you lose your ventricular cells in populations that were induced with retinoic acid. And finally, if you do uh, electrophysiological analysis, the bulk of the cells now from the retinoic acid-treated population have an atrial profile. So in this simple diagram, in the absence of retinoic acid, you get ventricular-like cells. With retinoic acid, you push everything atrial. So why is this important? Uh, if we look a little bit at RNA synthesis, and I'll go through this rather quickly, I'm sure many of you know, it's a product of ret uh, retinol or vitamin A to a, pro a to a number of enzymatic steps do we get to retinoic acid. The one I want to mention is retinaldehyde rehydrogenase. It's one of three isoforms. It's RALDH2 that you find in the developing embryo. It's essential to allow the cell to make retinoic acid. And many cells that respond to retinoic acid actually make it. And there's another enzymatic setup here to break it down. It's a P450 enzyme, so it's this balance. So you don't make too. If you want to, if you want cells not to respond, they have the P, uh, the CYP26A expression. And so if we look at some of the models that are out there, uh, the the concept is that at least some of the ventricular cells are made from mesoderm that migrates earlier than the cells that contribute to what we call the posterior part of the tube which gives rise to your atrial cells in your sinoatrial pacemakers. This is the region of RALDH2 expression and retinoic acid signaling. So we propose then that the mesoderm that makes, uh, that makes the atrial cells should express RALDH2 and respond to retinol. And we use this saldophore assay to measure RALDH2. This assay is a fluorescent-based assay that measures all aldehyde dehydrogenases, including the retinaldehyde dehydrogenases. And what you'll see here in our 10-6-induced population, just the kinetics showing very low but distinct populations 
of aldeflor positive mesoderm. So, is that enough to convince ourselves that we're making decent amounts? So, can we increase the size? And this goes back to the approach we used before. Are we inducing the appropriate mesoderm? And I'll show you just one example of this, of how if you decrease your BMP, you dramatically increase the size of your aldeflor positive mesoderm. But you take a hit on the troponin in T, or in other words, on the amount of um, cardiac output. If you then take this amount of activin and reduce your BMP, you restore your cardiac output. So now you have a very, very impressive amount of aldeflor positive mesoderm, and this is shown to correlate with RALDH2 expression. Interestingly, the population that doesn't show this actually expresses the SIMP marker. So in other words, we might imagine the ventricular mesoderm not to want to respond to retinol. If we then ask, can this population respond to retinol? You sort it, you show it retinol, and right here it shows you. It responds both to retinol and retinoic acid to convert what should be ventricular to atrial. So this is the model then that we in fact split very early on into two mesoderm populations, one making ventricular and the other atrial. Can we find an e equally interesting marker for ventricular? And this is just a let's try it and see approach where you take your cells, put them in an antibody screen. We have an antibody uh, a library at UHN, some 400 antibodies. And we identified glycophorin A as a marker on early mesoderm. And this, as you probably are aware, is a marker of red blood cells. When we, sh when we ran it across our two mesoderms now, we found that the cells that are preferentially giving rise to ventricular have 235A expression. Those with atrial do not. And the little bit of coex, uh, the, the populations that have both, the, 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 the uh, alpha 4 positive and the CD235 are not in the same cells. And here's the key experiment. If we kind of do this middle way induction where we have CD235A and aldeflor induced by the intermediate amounts of BMP and activin, you can ask the question. If you sort these and these, do they function differently? Both the pod reaggregation will make cardiomyocytes, but what you, and both in the absence of retinoic acid will make some ventricular cells. But these cells, the, the ones, the 235As, do not respond to retinol. The aldophores do both respond to retinoic acid. And I've shown this here. Key is the 235A positive mesoderm does not respond to retinol because it doesn't have the machinery to do it. They still will respond to retinoic acid. So this is really what we're looking at here. We have now populations that we can physically separate. We can specify and ask the question, what can these cells do? Now, with this marker for ventricular, can we optimize our ventricular output? And indeed, we can. We found in this case that BMP5 12 activin is optimal. Here you see a beautiful 235A, absolutely no aldefor, and very nice a ventricular development. And so, really, what we're looking at then is modest differences in these two cytokines that drive quite different populations. And here's the real problem, though. If you're going to say, well, I'm going to go home and reproduce this, you have to do these titrations for each line <coughs> and for each, and for each uh, uh, batch of cytokine. There's variability, unfortunately, in the purchase reagents. But nevertheless, you can do it with these markers. So why is this important? So let me give you a few examples. We've recently published uh, earlier this year that you can identify a population with pacemaker-like phenotype, that's the sinoatrial node pacemaker cells, as an NKX 2.5 negative population that expresses troponin T. In our highly enriched ventricular, we've largely purged the population of these cells. So we now have a population that's largely devoid of pacemaker cells. As you can see, the atrial popular mesoderm also makes these, and it's not pure atrial, as, as I will show you in a moment. So here's a, good, here's a real advantage. And with the 
with the depletion of these, these, this population contracts or beats at a much slower rate than these, and that might be advantageous when you want to think of putting these into, into an animal. I just have two more slides. Uh, so the improved ventricular potential comes from the 235A mesoderm. If you look at this versus this, 84 versus this. This will make some ventricular cells, but at a much poorer rate. And equally important, if you want to look at the expression profiles of several of the key, of the key uh, atrial genes, even with RA, these cells convert much better than these cells do. So inducing the correct mesoderm, we believe, is absolutely essential. And as a summary, we know that it's not just atrial that comes from these populations, but the sinoatrial node as well. So this is kind of the mesoderm, we believe, that would contribute to the posterior part of the tube, and this the anterior. So optimal for cell therapy, we believe, are these cells. This is really the, the steps forward. We've got to make billions of these cells, test in large animals, and this is work Mike LaFlemme is doing uh, here at UHN and the generation of the billions is in collaboration with CCRM. As a final slide and full disclosure, uh, we've, I, I'm a scientific co-founder of a company called Blue Rock Therapeutics, and why I bring this up, it's a new company focused exclusively on cell therapy using pluripotent-derived cells, launched last year, funding from Vince, Ven, Versant Ventures and Bayer, and it's got several objectives, and the one in Toronto is to do exactly what I talked about, take the cells we're making and move it towards clinic for cardiovascular disease. Other activities are cell-based therapy for Parkinson's at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, and the office will be in Boston. So with that, I will quit, I'll stop, and happy to take any questions. Thank you.